Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeremy Petrovich. I am one of the developmental editors for current protocols at Wiley. It is my pleasure today to introduce Mike Keeney. Mike Keeney has worked at the Department of Hematology located at the London Health Sciences Center in Canada and has been a key leader in the development of flow cytometry for both clinical and basic research applications. He is the current president of the International Clinical Cytometry Society and has served on the College of American Pathologists Diagnostic Immunology Resource Committee, which oversees quality assurance and flow cytometry since 1991. Mike has been actively involved in standardization efforts for clinical flow cytometry testing, contributing to several clinical and laboratory standards institute guidelines, as well as authoring or co-authoring over 100 manuscripts and several book chapters. In collaboration with Rob Sutherland from Toronto, Mike developed the most, currently most widely used method for CD34 enumeration and hemopoietic stem cell transplant known as the Ice Age Guidelines. In 2006, they were awarded the Wallace H. Coulter Lecturer Award, and in 2009, Mike was awarded a Distinguished Fellowship from the Canadian Society of Medical Laboratory Science in recognition of his achievements in medical laboratory technology. Mike is a much sought after speaker and has presented at many national and international meetings over his 38 year career. Most recently, he has been at the forefront of efforts to standardize the field of flow cytometric minimal residual disease testing in B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We thank Mike Keeney for taking the time to speak to us today on the use of the Clare Lab 10C system in a talk titled Initial Evaluation of the Clare Lab. 10C system in the immunophenotyping of leukemia and lymphoma for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you. So thank you, Jeremy, for that introduction. Um, just as conflict of interest, I'm a consultant for Beckman Coulter. And Beckman Coulter has also actually added this disclaimer. The presentation is sponsored by them. However, the content is scientific. It's non-promotional and educational. And if we read through, I'll let you read through that slide, but basically it says whatever I have to comment on, Beckman Coulter denies all knowledge of it. No, seriously, it's just a case of uh, making sure there's a disclaimer for my presentation today. So today's learning objectives, understand the process for routine cocktail selection and preparation. Describe the key concepts in the Clear Lab 10 color system design. Also to demonstrate using case studies the applicability of the clear lab reagents and evaluate the results of a clinical accuracy study that was performed using these reagents. Standard practice for most laboratories is to order individual reagents, sometimes from multiple vendors, and each antibody has to be individually titrated and validated for reactivity. Then the individual antibodies are combined and the combination is validated to ensure no unexpected changes in expression or reactivity. The process of making these cocktails is time consuming and complex with different amounts of each antibody required to make the multicolor batch. For eight to 10 and more antibodies, this process is open to a significant chance of error, which is not only expensive if antibody combinations are compromised, but can potentially impact patient results if not detected during the validation process. The Clear Lab 10 color system was designed from the Beckman Coulter Navios and Navios EX flow cytometers as an aid in the differential diagnosis of hematolymphoid malignancies, for example, chronic and acute leukemia, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, myeloma, myelodysplastic syndromes, and myeloproliferative neoplasms. A key point is that the reagents are pre titrated in a dried format and stable at room temperature for over 12 months. A single batch could be ordered for the entire year. While it does consist of a complete system for flow cytometry, including controls and analysis, results form only a part of the overall decision-making process in arriving at a patient diagnosis. This slide illustrates the composition of the four clear lab 10 color tubes, which com comprise a B, T, and two myeloid tubes. All tubes contain CD34 and CD45 as backbone markers, and additionally, the myeloid tube contains CD13 and HLA-DR. This redundancy allows abnormal populations to be tracked between tubes. The addition of CD200 in the B tube allows discrimination between CLL and mantle cell lymphoma in many cases, and CD34 allows the full maturation sequence of B cells to be viewed, separating early hematogones from abnormal B cell precursors. 
The inclusion of T-cell receptor gamma-delta can be very useful in suspecting malignancies of mature T-cells, and the M1 tube allows dissection of the myelomonocytic compartment. The M2 tube is excellent for myeloblast maturation and detection of myodysplastic syndrome and acute leukemia. The addition of CD19 is also helpful as not all four tubes may be run as a set, an abnormal immature B-cell population would be detected at present. Additionally, CD19 positive AML, as can be seen in cases with the translocation of T821, would also be detected. The M2 tube also contains all of the antibodies necessary to perform the recently modified OGATA score for mild dysplastic syndrome. This slide shows a schematic of the workflow for the Clear Lab system. Instrument setup is controlled by running alignment and targeting beads, followed by a compensation kit which has both captured beads and reagents necessary and matched to reagents in the test. Additionally, ClearLab has both a normal and abnormal level control, which is stable for several months. Once samples are received in a lab, they are washed, added to the tubes which already contain the dried down antibody, incubated, the red blood cells are then lysed, and the samples are run on the Navius or Navius EX cytometer. Analysis is performed offline using Kalusa software and pre-made temp templates which are provided with the system. This slide shows the components of the compensation kit. The majority are CD4 with CD8 for chrome orange and CD3 for ECD. Individual tubes are run in compensation matrix automatically generated by an instrument. Using individual verified tubes for each of the panels allows customization of compensation for each tube. There are clear lab control cells for both normal and abnormal populations. This is an example of the abnormal cell control stained with the B cell tube. Note a population of approximately 9%, which is CD34 positive. That's on the second plot showing side scatter versus CD34. The normal B cell population present stained clearly with CD19, 20, 200, and kappa lambda. Consistent colors are used throughout each tube, with granulocytes being blue, lymphocytes red, monocytes green, the CD45 dim population is colored purple, and where appropriate, B cells are colored orange. Levi Jennings charts automatically track the QC results for each tube over time for all key populations. This is an example of the Levi Jennings for the B cell tube. This moves full cytometry quality assurance for leukemia and lymphoma in a very positive direction, and something we really haven't had before. This is an example of the abnormal control for the T cell tube. Again, note the CD34 positive population and the clear separation of normal T cell populations. Natural killer cells can be identified by their CD3 negative, CD56 positive phenotype, as can gamma delta T cells, which can be seen in the bottom right hand plot as a small diagonal population. This is the abnormal M1 tube. In addition to identifying the abnormal population, monocytes are clearly defined by their expression of CD14, CD11B, and CD64. This is the second myeloid tube of the abnormal control cells. Note the abnormal population, again around 9%, is positive for CD34, CD117, and CD123, as you can see in the two bottom right-hand plots. Before we look at some clinical samples, we can review normal blood and bone marrow with the four clear lab tubes. Again, consistent colors are used throughout the analysis, with granulocytes being blue, lymphocytes red, monocytes green, CD45 dim are purple, and B cells are orange. The above slide illustrates the maturation sequence of normal B cells in a bone marrow sample. CD19 is used to gate both mature and immature B cells, also known as hematogones. Characteristically, the most immature cells are CD34 positive, exhibit bright CD10 and are negative CD20. The top left dot shows the expression of cap and lambda light chains is restricted to mature B cells. The bottom three plots display the most immature B cells, colored black, and these are CD34 positive, bright CD10, and mainly CD20 negative, and surface immunoglobulin negative. The normal blood T cell tube shows normal distribution of CD4 and CD8. Our natural killer cells can be seen in the bottom third from the left plot, which shows CD3 minus CD56 plus. And again, a small population of gamma delta T cells can be seen in the bottom left hand plot. For the first myeloid tube, we see mature granulocytes as blue and positive for CD16, 11B, CD13, and CD10. On the top right-hand plot, you can see I've identified a small population that's CD13 plus 16 minus, and that would correspond to eosinophils. 
This is a representation of a normal bone marrow when we're looking at CD13 and 16. This has often been referred to as a Nike swoosh. You see a normal maturation pattern where we have the most immature cells of CD13 positive, CD16 negative. And as the myeloid cells go through the promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte mature phase, they first lose both 13 and 16 and then acquire CD13 and 16 until at the mature neutrophil they brightly express 13 and 16. A disruption of this pattern is often seen in myelosplastic syndrome with a loss of CD16. And this is a normal blood with the second myeloid tube. The CD45 dim population is CD123 positive, and that corresponds to either base fills or, or plasma city dendritic cells. Note I'm only highlighting key plots here. There is an educational booklet that comes with the Clear Library Agent system. That educational booklet covers all four tubes for all disease states. However, as we move forward to look at different diseases, I will only be highlighting a few dot plots so that you actually don't suffer from information overload. So case one, this is a 55-year-old male that presented with a lymphocytosis for over three months and a peripheral blood sample was submitted for flow cytometry. This is the CBC result. And we can see the white count is increased at 19. The hemoglobin is well preserved at 162, as are the platelets, which are normal at 150. However, there is a lymphocytosis with 14 times 10 to the 9 lymphocytes per litre. If we look at the morphology, we can see on the left-hand side, they're mature, small lymphocytes with a soccer ball nuclear chromatin pattern. And if we look at the right-hand side, we can actually see there are smudge cells present in the sample. The population we're interested in here are the orange or the B cell population. The flow cytometry immunophenotyping identified a phenotypically distinct population with expression of intermediate to bright CD5, intermediate CD19, and low to intermediate CD20. CD38 was low to absent, and CD45 was bright, as was CD200. Uh, if we look at the uh, kappa lambda staining, you can see that there's actually dim surface lambda light expression. The cells are also negative for CD10 and were negative for all other T and myeloid markers. Compared with normal B cells, the expression of CD5, decreased CD20, and lambda light chain restriction taken together, the immunophenotype is most consistent with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. However, a definitive diagnosis of CLL or SLL using current WHO criteria requires a demonstration of disease-related clinical and or lab findings and or the presence of greater than 5,000 neoplastic cells per microliter in the peripheral blood. Therefore, correlation with clinical laboratory data is necessary and additional immunophenotyping may be warranted. For example, in uh, my lab, we would run CD38 or CD49D, which may have some prognostic significance. This case was, in fact, uh, CLL as the absolute lymph count, the abnormal lymph count was greater than 5,000. This next case is of a 55-year-old male who presented with organomegaly and a bone marrow was submitted for full cytometry. If we look at the CBC, the white count is 20.2, the hemoglobin is slightly reduced at 127, the platelets are moderately reduced at 94, and there is a lymphocytosis at 11.1. The morphology in this case is quite different from the previous case where we can see clumped chromatin and prominent nuclear clefts in most of the cells. Again, we're looking at the B cell orange population. The flow cytometry immunophenotyping identified a distinct population of cells with the expression of intermediate to bright CD5, intermediate CD19, bright 20, intermediate CD38, bright CD45, and bright surface lambda light chains. Note at the bottom right-hand plot, you can see compared to the previous case that the lambda PE is significantly more, is, is expressed at a significantly higher level than the previous case. Compared with normal B cells, expression of CD5, absence of CD200, and lambda light chain restrictions are obviously aberrant. This would be most consistent with a macro cell lymphoma, especially with the lack of the CD200 and the morphology with the clefted cells. However, Correlation with clinical and morphological data are essential in this case, and FISH studies for T1114 is recommended. The third case is a 70-year-old male who presents to ER with palpitations and bruising. Peripheral blood films were circulating blasts, and a blood sample was submitted for full cytometry. 
We can see the white cell count is 26.7, so it's significantly in increased. The hemoglobin is 37, so it's significantly reduced from normal, 135. The platelets are also extremely low at 10, and the differential showed blast population of 19,000. The morphology shows cells are slightly larger than mature lymphocytes with an immature chromatin pattern and a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. In this case, the flow cytometry identifies a distinct population of cells with expression of dim CD13, intermediate CD19, with variable CD20 and bright CD34. Dim CD45, along with low to intermediate 123, is also seen, as well as intermediate HLA-DR. The cells were negative for CD10, CD33, and CD117, or other B or T or myeloid markers. Compared with normal B cells, increase in size scatter, absence of CD10, increase in CD34 and CD38, and a presence of 123 are aberrant. Taken together, the findings in this case are most consistent with a B lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma. However, additional phenotyping was performed that showed the cells were positive for cytoplasmic CD79A and negative for myeloperoxidase. Case number four is of a 32-year-old male who presents with circulating blasts on a peripheral blood smear. A peripheral whole blood sample was submitted for flow cytometry. When we look at the white count, in this case, it's extremely high at 211.9. Again, the hemoglobin is very low at 44 and platelets significantly reduced at 24. The blood film showed blasts at over 200,000. The morphology here shows immature chromatin with high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio without granules, very small, immature looking cells. In this case, the immunophenotype showed dim CD45. The population was positive for CD5, CD2, CD7, and CD4, CD34, and also CD10. Of note, the cells were surface CD3 negative, as can be seen in the second plot on the top from the left. Follow-up studies included intracellular CD3 positivity and negative for myeloperoxidase and CD79A. This would be consistent with an acute T lymphoblastic leukemia, which comprised around 15% of pediatric ALL, with the others majority being B, BLL, as was seen in a previous case. In the fifth case, it's a 20-year-old male who presented with lymphadenopathy and a mediastinal mass. In this case, a lymph node biopsy was sent for flow cytometry for immunophenotyping. When we look at the peripheral blood, the white count's normal with no abnormal cells noted in the peripheral blood, a normal differential with neutrophils at three lymphocytes reduced slightly at 0.8. There's an increase in monocytes, however, there's no abnormal cells are noted in this. The hemoglobin is reduced at 92, and the platelets are significantly reduced at 11. This is a side to spin of the lymph node, showing small blue cells with a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. This case is an amino phenotype that's CD2 positive, 5 positive, 7 positive. The cells are CD4 dim or partially positive, CD38 bright, CD10 positive, and again CD3 negative. Follow-up studies showed intracellular CD3 positive with myeloproxidase and CD79A being negative. This is a case of lymphoblastic lymphoma. This condition arises from the immature T cells in about 85 to 90 percent of cases and immature B cells in a major of cases. It's a rare disease, about 2 percent of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, although it accounts for 25 to 30 percent of childhood non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and is closely related to T lymphoblastic leukemia. Patients with a lymphoblastic lymphoma usually present with painless lymphadenopathy and a mediastinal mass is common, occurring in 50 to 75 percent of patients. And a B cell subtype they usually lack this mediastinal mass. Case number six. This is a 60-year-old male who presented with severe anemia and blast reported in a peripheral blood film. When we look at the CBC, the white count is 35.7, the hemoglobin 65, and platelets significantly reduced to 15. Also, there were blasts noted in the peripheral blood film. When we look at the morphology, we can see a significantly increased white count on the left-hand side, 
and also large blasts with a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and some with and some without granules. This slide is just showing that most of the cells are negative for key T and B cell markers. However, you can see in the bottom left-hand column that the cells are positive for CD34. Looking at the myeloid tubes, we have a phenotype that's CD33+, CD13 dim to negative. The cells are CD34+, CD117+, and CD123+. They also express CD38 and are negative for the mature myeloid markers CD16, 64, and 15. In a 2016 update to the WHO, the category AML not otherwise specified includes those acute myeloid leukemia subtypes not associated with the current genetic abnormalities or AML with myodysplasia-related changes, therapy-related AML, those with germline predispositions, myeloid perforations related to Down syndrome. However, AML not otherwise specified still comprises 30 to 40% of AML cases. The diagnosis of AML requires the presence of at least 20% leukemic cells in the bone marrow or peripheral blood, which this case had. Case number seven is from a 70-year-old female who presented with pancytopenia. A bone marrow was submitted for flow cytometry. We can see she's very pancytopenic with a white count of one hemoglobin of 69. However, the platelets are reasonably preserved at 146, and there's also a presence of nucleated red blood cells was noted on a peripheral blood film. Because of the very low white count in the peripheral blood, it was difficult to visualize the abnormal cells. However, we can see in the left-hand side, in the top corner, there's a nucleated red cell, and the cell in the bottom that we hone into, it, which is on the right-hand side, we can see occasional blasts with large irregular nucleus and no, no visible granules. In this case, you can see I've highlighted the abnormal population. The phenotype is CD33+, it's CD13 dim, it's CD64+, HLADR extremely bright, 3+, it's dim for CD14, positive for CD123 and CD11 b negative, I'm sorry, CD11 be positive and it's negative for CD34. This is another case of AML not otherwise specified. However, in this case, it's an acute monoblastic leukemia with greater than 20% blasts, of which 80% are monoblasts or promonocytes. The bright CD33, CD15, and HDR are helpful, as well as CD64. Many of these cases are CD7 positive, although this case wasn't. It's important to recognize that promonocytes are considered blast equivalents for purposes of, de of defining acute monoblastic leukemia. The last case I have is this case number eight. is an 85-year-old male with known chronic lymphocytic leukemia who presents with anemia and bone pain. A bone marrow aspirate was submitted for flow cytometry. The CBC shows a white count of 12.9, reduced hemoglobin 85, preserved platelets, and a moderate lymphocytosis at 9.7. When we look at the bone marrow, we can see there are small lymphocytes, but also if we look closely at the right-hand side, you can see there's a population of cells with a plasmacytoid look to them. There's two populations here. The CD45 dim population is identified as normal with the purple. However, because there's two abnormal populations, I've chosen to color the second abnormal population black. And in case one, the flow cytometric immunophenotyping identified a phenotypically distinct population of cells with expression of intermediate to bright CD5, intermediate CD19, low to intermediate CD20, and low to absent CD38 with bright CD45 and intermediate CD200. Note the presence of dim surface lambda light chains and lack of expression of CD10 and there's no T or other myeloid markers. So this is consistent with the patient's known diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Looking at the CD45 dim population, it was positive very brightly for CD38, positive for HLA-DR, CD56 and CD13. CD19 and 20 were dim to negative as were other B and T cell markers. Surface light chain expression was not interpretable. However, follow-up studies showed these cells to be positive for kappa and cytoplasmic staining. 
Flow cytometry showed the expected CLL population 19 plus 5 plus 20 dim with dim monoclonal lambda expression. Taken together with the morphology with greater than 20% plasma cells noted in the bone marrow, this case represents CLL that's developed a separate clone leading to myeloma in the same patient. We know this is a separate clone because one population is kappa and the other population is lambda. Turning to the clinical accuracy diagnostic accuracy study, a total of 453 cases were examined at four centres in the USA, Canada and Europe. The disease categories had an excellent rep representation of disease types typically encountered in the flow cytometry laboratory. So if we look along the top, we can see that we had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we had chronic leukemia, acute leukemia, plasma cell neoplasms, myodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasm, and, and others, which pretty much breaks down well into what we would see certainly in my lab. The samples were compared to clinical diagnostic outcome, which was basically, does the patient have a final outcome as being malignant or non-malignant? We can see here that the clear lab detected the presence of our abnormal population 235 out of a total of 245 malignant cases. Also, the absence of an abnormal phenotype was seen in 190 out of 208 cases. This has to be clarified. The results were compared to the patient's final diagnosis. So the malignant, non-malignant was based solely on interpretation of flow cytometric data. That is, the data reviewers were blended to clinical data. Of the 18 classed as malignant with the absence of an abnormal phenotype, most were lymphoma stagings that had a negative bone marrow but had a clinical outcome of being malignant. So although they did have a final diagnosis of malignancy, they were clear in the bone marrow. Other cases seen in this group would be early stages of myelodysplastic syndrome. So when we look at the sensitivity and specificity, it's at least uh, 0.93, specificity 0.95, with excellent positive predictive value and negative predictive value. So in conclusion, the clear lab reagents are dried, stable, and highly reliable. They come as a complete standardized system from instrument setup to compensation, quality control reagents, analysis protocols, and an excellent educational booklet that was edited by Brent Wood. The results of the clinical study showed excellent concordance and specificity and sensitivity. And as I mentioned, there is an, an excellent training guide that comes along with that. And with that, I'll just acknowledge the four centres involved in it, my centre, London Health Science Centre in Ontario, Canada, Calgary Laboratory Services, there was a centre in Munich, Germany, Dr. Cairns Lab, and also Neo Genomics Laboratory in Fort Myers, Florida. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mike, for that great presentation. Uh, so one of the first, so one of the first questions is, is ClearLab 10C system FDA approved? Yes, it it is actually it was approved. I think earlier last month, and it's also approved in Europe. So it's both CE and FDA approval now. Uh, so one thing that routinely pops up. Um, dealing with systems like this is how often do you really need to perform compensation or calibration on these systems? Because the reagents are lyophilized or actually dried down reagents are very, very stable. And the recommendation is to com do compensation once a month. Now, that's you can actually even extend that in the fact that just checking the compensation daily to make sure that the cells are falling where they should, then with, unless there's any major changes to the instrument, that can probably be extended. But the recommendation is to compensate about once a month. Okay. Uh, in general, do you need to run all four tubes on all patients? No, that would certainly be the laboratory's choice. And, and uh, my understanding is the the cells the tubes will be sold separately, so you can buy 
for example, if you, we do many more B cell cases than we do T or myeloid cases, then it may be sufficient just to run for, for these certain cases, specifically for things like CLL, just run the B cell tube without having to run the others with it. Okay. Uh, so in regards to just uh, some of the samples, uh, so have these panels been tested on pre-washed pre blood or bulk lysed bone marrow? Yes, they've been, they have been tested on both and they work very well. So the, the standard procedure actually is to do a pre-wash and the reason we do that is if you're running more than one of the, the tubes, the B cell tube has kappa lambda in it and it requires that the cells are washed before they're, they're actually stained. So it's easier just to do a bulk lice of the sample and then just use that for all of the tubes that you're running. Uh, so, what is the value of Clear Lab, uh, the Clear Lab system, in MDS diagnostics? Myelodysplastic syndrome can be quite difficult, especially in the early stages, to diagnose. Um, there are two, two things that myeloid tubes can be used to estimate the blast percentage. Um, once you have over 5% blast, then myelodysplastic syndrome is classified as an MDS1 or an MDS2, depending on the blast count. However, where it's most useful is in the difficult cases where there's less than 5% blast. In this case, because you can perform the OGATA score based on the M2 tube and also look at the pattern and expression of the different cell surface markers, for example, loss of CD10 or loss of CD16, then these tubes are actually very, very useful for looking at uh, early stage myodysplastic syndrome. Um, let's see. So next question is, uh, what are your thoughts on using CD200 in conjunction with CD20 and light chain intensity to diagnose CLL without evaluation of CD23? There are many of the recommendations, and certainly the European recommendations, still do include CD23. However, we have certainly found that uh, the combination of the CD200 positive with CD19.5 and down expression of, of light chains in almost all cases will identify as CLL. Again, we take these into account with the morphology of the cells and also with other clinical di uh, diagnostic information. So we, we no longer run CD23 routinely. Okay. Uh, what are the steps necessary to validate this system per uh, CAP guidelines or regulations? That's, that's a really good point. I mean, it is sold as a, as a turnkey system. Um, and the fact that because it's FDA approved, if, if it's used exactly as is, then most of the work has already been done for laboratory. However, you would need to run in parallel a, a laboratory-defined number of tests just to ensure that you are retrieving the same results as you would with your, your standard panel. So, for example, uh, you know, 50 to 60 samples covering a range of leukemia, lymphoma, mature, immature cells would, would have to be run just to show that in your hands the system is behaving as, as recommended. Uh, is there is the compensation in the system or uh, the gating automated? Uh, so, like, what part of the analysis is are manual? Yeah, the compensation running the compensation panel is done in a, in a fairly automated way. So, once you run the compensation tubes, there is a verified tube for each of the four tests, and you can modify slightly if required just to fine tweak the compensation and then that's locked down and you can then use that compensation for any patient testing tubes. The analysis protocols are are part of the system. However, you may have to move gates around a little bit just to pick off the specific population you're interested in. But yes, the analysis does come with, with uh, standard templates. Okay. Uh, let's see. So next question is, uh, so the clear lab tubes, are, somebody was asking, they believe they're designed to be used to be processed with uh, IO tests. Have you evaluated clear lab with other lysis solutions? No. Um, it, again, because it's FDA approved, then it should be used as is. If it's going to be used with any different lysis agent that comes with the, with the kit, then that would need to be validated by the lab. 
Is the pre-made uh, Kaluza template reporting of the Clear Lab system part of the standardized system of Clear Lab, or is that dependent, or the re will the reporting of that be dependent upon the laboratory? The reporting is dependent on the laboratory. The the templates will uh, give you the results and give you the percentages of normal populations and normal populations. However, for example, in my lab, we do not report percentages other than the percent of blasts. So a report would basically say the sample is positive for specific markers, negative for other markers, and draw a conclusion. But we would not give out percentages for each and cell surface marker. Some laboratories still prefer to do that, although the Bethesda guide guidelines specifically state that you should not uh, report percentages on all populations. Uh, do you have any experience using experience doing analysis of samples the day after collection? Yes, and you know, I I I'm not sure what the the claim is within the uh, ten color. Clear lab reagents. It certainly would be good up to 24 hours. We do test our samples out further than that, and haven't seen any any problems. But each lab would have to validate that. We we often run samples out, out to 48 hours. But that's been validated within my own lab. Okay. Yeah. So kind of a related to that. So what are some of the what are some of the common technical issues that might you might encounter when using the Clear Lab system? Because it's very standardized, um, you, you get very quickly get used to noting any issues. For example, if you had a very bright lambda light chain uh, population, then you could see some compensation issues between lambda and the nearest fluorochrome, which is on ECD. That just needs a slight touch of the compensation for that. But because you're using, you can have a year's worth of reagents exactly the same with exactly the same batch, so there are very few issues where you see technical issues. Uh, it would be very easy to identify a change from one day to the next, but the stability of the reagents makes that very uncommon. Okay. So, so in terms of looking at some uh, specific cases, can you are you able to diagnose hairy cell leukemia using this B cell tube? No. You could Id identify a suspicious population based on the light scatter and based on the overexpression of CD20 and bright expression of surface immunoglobulin. However, you would need to run a confirmatory tube that uh, would have CD11C, CD103, and CD25 in it. And same with most la most laboratories would also run, on, for many of the cases, would run a cytoplasmic tube, which would have myeloproxidase in it. Not not for that specific case, but these four tubes can pick off most disorders, but still need to be followed up with, uh, in some cases, with, with other tubes. Mm -hmm. So how would you look for aberrant expression of myeloid markers on B all if you are not running in, like, the M2 tube? If on BALL, if I was yeah, running sorry, a BALL, yes. yeah, actually, if I was running BALL, I would probably run almost all of the tubes here um, to look for aberrant expression, because it's it's certainly possible for any new acute leukemia. We tend to run all all tubes that allows us to detect abnormal expression, which can actually be used to monitor minimal residual disease. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um. Would you recommend or do you use customized customized dried down tubes for follow up testing for markers that are not included in the clear lab panel, such as cytoplasmic markers? Yes, um it certainly is something that can be can be uh, produced by Beckman Coulter is to request a specific tube that has markers that can be used for intracellular staining. Someone along the lines, are you planning tubes for MRD testing for ALL and others? Um, that's a question back to Beckman Coulter. Um, I certainly, I work with COG, um, the Cooperative Oncology Group and the Foundation for National Institute of Health and we are working on uh, moving from six color COG testing to eight color COG testing tubes. However, there has not been a decision as far as I'm aware from Beckman Coulter to provide a, a standardized product for that. Okay. Um, so the controls have defined percentage targets 
So the controls that we have, uh, do they have defined percentage targets per marker, uh, or can they be used away from the 10C kit? From the 10C kit, such for homebrew assays, or do they in a, but be able to be applied to the same targets? Yeah, I think um, that's one of the really good things about the controls is you, you could just um, buy the controls in any full cytometry lab could use the controls. So it's something we really haven't had before is an abnormal control population. So it'd be very useful um, as, as standalone as well. Uh, somebody asked how you would how one would calculate the exact percentages of, of blast populations for samples which have NRBCs. We combine our morphology with flow cytometry. So, for example, we would express BLAST as a percent of CD45 and also as a percent of all nucleated cells based on um, looking at uh, bone marrow morphology. So, for example, if you had 50% BLAST with CD45 but you also had 50 nucleated red blood cells, then we would report 50% of CD45, which is approximately 35% of total nucleated cells, something like that. Okay. Uh, some of the, for during the presentation, you were describing uh, antigen, antigen intensities. Uh, is there a general set of guidelines for interpreting that? In the Bethesda guidelines, which were published in 2006, um, the general guidelines are compared to normal. So within your tube, there's almost always a normal population. For example, CD5 expression on normal T cells, if you have a residual normal T cell population, you can compare the expression of the abnormal. And it's just, you know, dim, normal, bright. It's very simple to do that, or negative. In almost every sample, you will have at least a small population of residual normal cells for each population. Okay. Uh... So I think that actually wraps up most of the questions we have for today. Um, I would very much like to thank uh, Mike Keeney for giving us this, pre this presentation. Uh, the further questions uh, can be forwarded. Uh, we will send off to to, to Mike, uh, so they will be available. And also today's so in general today's presentation was sponsored by Beckman Coulter in partnership with Wiley's Current Protocols Journals. Uh, this webinar will be available for on-demand viewing at the Current Protocols website at www.currentprotocols.com underneath the webinars section. Uh, just one last time, I would think, like to thank Mike for his time and his presentation, and thank you everyone for attending. And certainly, Jared, I'd just like to re reinforce that. Is, um, anyone who has any follow-up questions, feel free to contact me directly as well. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.